Um, so thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, as the title says, uh, this has been an opportunity to pull together some thoughts from a number of different pieces of work around primary care systems um, with a real focus on equity and how the systems that we have structured produce or entrench um, uh, inequities in access. I'm now in, um, I now live and work at Dalhousie, which is located, I don't live there, I work there, uh, in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, the Dalhousie Territorial Acknowledgement includes this text uh, that we are all treaty people making reference um, and uh, a sort of call to honor uh, peace and friendship treaties made centuries ago with the Mi'kmaq people and which did not surrender rights to land or resources. Um, Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution recognizes and affirms these treaties um, and rights to land uh, that must be honored. And this recognizes that as settlers, um, you know, I'm a settler, we have a role in ensuring that this is the case. Um, part of my talk today will also talk about historical legacies that have shaped our current systems or current systems of primary care um, experienced by people differently and how uh, inequities uh, and experiences for Indigenous people in Canada have been long entrenched. So again, today is an opportunity for me to pull together some thoughts. Um, I know I'm speaking to a broad audience, so I want to make my little case for why primary care and make the argument that if we're interested in healthcare delivery, at least, or like access to health services, we really have to pay attention to primary care, recognizing that there are a whole host of other things to pay attention to when we're focused on equity and health outcomes. Um, so I wanna give a little bit of context to current systems and how they got that way. Um, and really emphasize that we have quite limited systems in Canada that are essentially systems for physician payment rather than real healthcare delivery systems. And then I'm gonna share some data about equity and primary care access pulled from a bunch of different work. Um, but that really makes the case that it is bad and it is getting worse. Um, and current systems, I think we can uh, see from the results of them are set up to reproduce and entrench inequities. Um, I'm gonna conclude with some thoughts um, around this topic of reimagining what a front door might look like for healthcare in Canada. And I'll explain what I mean by that in more detail later. Um, Grateful for funding support uh, received. I also will present some data accessed by a population data BC and need to emphasize that any conclusions drawn from that are mine and not those of the Ministry of Health or people who supplied the data. I wanna to point to a whole bunch of study teams. Again, this is sort of like picked from a bunch of different work. Um, so this includes people across the country, uh, but also at CGSHE. So special shout out to the IRIS project um, and everyone who's been involved in that work. It's been such a privilege to be connected to the center through that. So why primary care and why front door in the title? Um, so when I say primary care, I mean day-to-day um, -day health services delivered by family doctors, nurse practitioners, or other healthcare providers. Um, we're at like a national level or regional level, strong primary care systems have been associated with greater equity and health outcomes um, while contributing to better experiences for patients and providers and efficiency in systems. Um, and ideally having an ongoing relationship with a primary care provider um, means that you have someone who understands the context in which you live and can respond effectively to your needs um, with attention to people uh, experiencing economic and social marginalization. Um, and then in Canada, primary care is very much framed as a first and main point of access. And this is built into systems in that in order for you to see a specialist, you have to have a referral from a primary care provider. Um, so more equitable access to that front door of primary care um, has the potential to trickle through your experiences throughout the systems. Um, but as such, it's really important that it's actually functioning as a welcoming and accessible front door. And I will make the case that it is not. Um, so if it's working well, it means expanded access to needed services, better quality of care, more of a focus on prevention, um, and early management of health problems, um, and, uh, can sort of shepherd you through and provide navigation through a complex health system in a way that really meets your needs. Um, but if it's not doing that, um, I'm gonna argue we have a problem both for primary care and throughout the health system. A little note on terminology, you'll notice I say primary care, and this is a deliberate choice. So this is a photo taken from the International Conference on Primary Health Care um, in Alma Ata, which put 
forth um, a broad definition of primary care, primary health care as integrated accessible health care um, by clinicians who are delivered by clinicians who are accountable for a large majority of personal health needs, developed in sustained partnership with patients and practicing in the context of family and community. Um, so I don't use that language because that's not actually the system we have in Canada. Um, it's a more limited definition that more accurately describes the services available to people here. Um, that's simply a sort of um, first contact to access to care, coordination when you need services elsewhere and navigation throughout the health system. So what that looks like right now and a little bit on how they, we got that way. Um, let me start with some historical context. So I wanna call uh, to attention four acts, federal acts that have shaped the system we have today and are still very much act on our experiences of care in Canada. So in 1867, the Constitution Acts establishes the federal and provincial division of powers that means that primary care is a provincial responsibility. What this means is that systems differ dramatically across provinces and where substantial changes have been made in some provinces and others, this has not been the case. Um, and your experiences of access and care will likely be really different across provinces. Following quickly on the Constitution Act, the Indian Act entrenched inferior and unequal provision of care for First Nations people and then established that under federal jurisdiction. So I want to emphasize at the very like root of our systems of health uh, care delivery or jurisdictional disputes over coverage and very paternalistic responsibility for uh, care for Indigenous people that carries through to today. Skipping ahead a bit, um, the establishment of our the system that is often called Medicare um, can be traced back to the 1966 Medical Care Act. And this followed on um, the event of a strike in Saskatchewan uh, where physicians were uh, protesting against expanded government um, involvement in healthcare funding and delivery. And this established sort of the central compromise in Canada's publicly funded but privately delivered system, which means that for the most part in primary care, um, it's, a, it's delivered by uh, private providers, so physicians in independent practice who are probably incorporated and run a business, but with public payments. Um, this also means that from the start, we never had a public system of primary care delivery. We had a system of payments and then private delivery on the part of uh, physicians. And then jumping ahead to 1984, um, the Canada Health Act um, affirmed uh, this idea of universal coverage, but for a very limited range of services and for a selected group of people. So it affirms this idea that everyone would have complete coverage uh, for physicians and hospital services if you are a resident of a province. And the determination of who is a resident is left up to provincial jurisdiction and excludes people with precarious or no status. Um, in contrast to many other countries that uh, provide uh, coverage for everyone who actually lives there, not this artificial definition of resident. So taken together, these events um, have shaped a system that means that primary care looks pretty different depending on where you're accessing it, but has um, this sort of consistent feature where uh, public pro provision is at arm's length and a, there's a huge private role um, in delivery of care. So some pictures about what the, this might look like in BC, um, uh, that uh, we've had some sort of exciting uh, developments in provision where uh, communities have taken control over delivery of care. Um, uh, and have an active role in care provision. So the top two pictures, um, a picture from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and the Mindane Community Health Center would be examples where community has a role in planning and shaping the services that they receive. The central picture is actually what the majority of care looks like in British Columbia, where it's a family physician in private practice who's renting a space and delivers care to the people who show up there and to who they agree to take on as patients. Emergency department plays a really prominent role in primary care delivery in BC and in other provinces. And then we're also seeing a really pronounced um, and growing role of corporate delivery of primary care. So the example of a walk-in clinic in um, a superstore uh, here in Nova Scotia, there's an expanded role for <laughs> SOBs in delivery of primary care. That's definitely a growing trend. Um, 
So what this means is that to summarize primary care systems in Canada, it's mostly physician payment systems. And what that means is the payment is for a patient in front of a clinician at any given time. So it's not designed for patients ongoing care and it, there's no responsibility or accountability or structure to take care of patients who never actually made it through the door. It's very much organized around who's at, where you're getting a fee-for-service payment, um, which is a payment simply for the person in front of you and not for ongoing care. So taken together, this means that Canada performs poorly on international primary care indicators, um, being able to get a same or next day appointment, um, uh, care on evenings and weekends, uh, or uh, but we do perform a little bit better on rating the care, uh, the quality of care that when we actually get to see a physician um, as excellent or good. And this is contributed to um, a sort of proliferation of headlines and real concern on the part of the public about whether they're able to access the care they need. So headlines from BC about worsening family physician shortages or enclosures of clinics or in people struggling to get into that front door of healthcare in British Columbia and similar trends across the country. This is borne out by data from surveys where the percentage of people with a regular source of primary care is falling. But at the same time, the supply of family physicians is actually growing, which is a bit of a policy puzzle. Um, and I think what connects this is some of the approaches to primary care reform to date that really haven't equipped us with a modern system of care to, able to meet changing needs of populations. So up to this point, um, when provinces have tried to make changes to that system of delivery where private providers uh, deliver care and are paid from provincial funds, um, there have been a lot of financial incentives, um, but few other resources to support change. Um, and what this is, uh, this means is that um, often this creates an incentive to uh, see patients with less complex needs, if you're going to get paid the same amount, um, and uh, we don't actually have teams or the resources in place to support uh, family physicians and other care providers to actually meet people's sort of well-rounded needs. One thing that's been a feature of many reforms, and that's a really important mechanism that entrenches inequity that I want to emphasize is that participation in reforms has often been voluntary, which means that physicians who are the targets of reforms make choices about whether to participate and which patients to see, sorry, the typo there, um, or, and I'll show you some data on this later. Um, there's also a mechanism where, where we're rolling out new innovations or policies or service delivery models. Often that goes to communicate communities that are deemed ready or that are ready to sort of like jump on board, implement the new model and be a flashy front page picture for provincial governments, um, which does not necessarily and in most cases does not align with communities that most need more resources for primary care. Um, and I, what I really want to emphasize is despite promises to support models of care with community government governance, where there's a direct role and accountability to um, a patient or a community or patient population as part of the running of the clinic, um, we really haven't seen any support for this over the past decades. Um, and if we look at policy documents up to about 2017, there's really not even much mention of equity. Um, and that is changing though, and I'll get to that later. So look, a little screenshot from a policy scan that supports some of these observations. Um, and so with that framing, what I wanna do is show you some data now about what that has meant for uh, changes in access to primary care over the past 20 years, when these have been the dominant policy mechanisms at play. So one study we've done is looking at the question of when enrollment with a primary care physician is voluntary and like based on an incentive, who gets enrolled? So here we had um, data from the healthcare systems in British Columbia and Quebec, where provinces had both implemented incentive policies paying physicians to try to encourage them to take on more patients. So this was like a one-time payment per year to try to um, uh, increase the number of physicians who uh, had, or patients who had a regular family doctor. And there were sort of two types of programs in each province. Um, under one set of programs, there was eligibility based on health status. Uh, so if you had a chronic condition, if you were a senior typically, um, and then the others were open to the general public. 
we see strong income gradients in enrollment, especially when the programs are open to the general public with no eligibility based on health status when we look across income gradients. So we know that poverty creates illness. Um, so, we, uh, and we, so we know that on average, people who have chronic conditions live in lower income neighborhoods. So we would have hoped that enrollment was higher in lower income neighborhoods. That was not the case in any program. Um, but when enrollment programs are simply open to the general public with not, e not even tied to health status at all, we see these really pronounced differences um, by uh, income quintile, which speaks to the mechanisms we've probably been familiar with to access a family physician, and that they're often taking on friends or people who are referred through their own personal networks um, and uh, and uh, open incentive like this with no attention to who actually needs access um, can only serve to entrench this. It also not shown on this slide, but when we look for, at people who've been treated for mental or substance use disorders, um, who might really need a family physician, they were much less likely to be enrolled under these programs. And when we look back at the service use for people who are enrolled, they already had like regular service and pretty good access. Um, so that what was a substantial investment to try to expand access in both of these provinces only served to entrench who actually had access to a regular doctor. Okay, then flipping to some data in BC, just looking really basically at primary care visits per person over time, um, so back to about 20 years. This isn't adjusted for anything, it's just the raw analysis. Um, you can see that in lightest blue, that's people who live in the lowest income uh, quintile. Oh, I should say, I keep using like data on income quintile of residents because that's all we really have when we connect it to the, um, uh, the um, administrative data, like health system data that I use in this research. So it is an incomplete proxy for social position. Um, and we might expect even more dramatic differences if we had a more precise or more precise and individual level measures, but still the trends are pretty concerning. So again, not adjusting for everything. In 1999-2000, we can see that people who lived in the lowest income quintiles used more services for primary care. And again, as poverty creates illness, we would expect that to be the case. Um, and that, that as system responding to that, that we would see the pattern that we do observe in 1999-2000 with higher service use among people um, in lower income quintiles. As you'll see moving forward in time and in the context of these policy reforms, that collapses. So in the most recent year of data, there's fairly little difference in um, service use by income quintile within primary care. Then when we look at specialist referrals, so what has to happen here is that a specialist is like, or a primary care provider has met with you, identified the need for a specialist and submits a referral. Um, so this isn't the number of specialist visits, just did you get a refer, like number of referrals to specialists per person? Um, and, and generally walk-in clinics aren't doing a lot of referring. It, you have to have a regular doctor to have that mechanism. You'll see that a really pronounced gradient emerges such that um, among people in the highest income quintile, referrals have remained pretty constant, um, but this has declined um, in a clear gradient by income quintile. Um, again, likely speaking to who has access to a regular provider who's willing to make these connections. Um, uh, and so this is really concerning for that um, access and navigation elsewhere within the health system. And then I just wanna note that this is just the raw data, but when we adjust for like the conditions people have been treated for within health data and other personal characteristics, we see the same trend with a really, with a significant interaction between at uh, time and level of income uh, showing this sort of disproportionate change over time by income quintile. Some of these, I've just done BC data here, but there's evidence from other settings in Canada that sort of bears out similar patterns. In Ontario, enrollment in new capitated family health networks was lower in the lowest income group. Same thing um, in primary care networks um, in Alberta in a study of folks with diabetes. Uh, screening gaps grew wider in Ontario in the context of payment reform. Um, and in Quebec, the differences were generally stable, but no sort of 
changes or improvement. So I'd done some work in BC, but wanted to see what the national picture looked like with respect to um, trends. Data are limited, so we turned to uh, the Canadian Community Health Survey, which is a national survey um, meant to uh, capture information on healthcare use and health status. Um, and what we tried to do was like match up where we had similar measures in place over time. So it's pretty limited. Um, we can look at whether you said you had a regular medical provider, um, had a regular place of care or consulted with a medical professional in the last year. So the first two sort of speak to your potential for access, like would you have a place to go if you needed care? And then the last one is simply like, did you use services? Um, uh, and then we're comparing changes by a few different variables that are also consistently reported in the two time periods in the Canadian Community Health Survey. So income, do you own the dwelling where you reside? Um, immigration, actually this should be described as immigration group in that we're comparing people who've immigrated recently to people who immigrated more than 10 years ago or who were born in Canada. And then a variable that's labeled ethnicity, the question is actually, um, are you a member of a racial or cultural group? And then in the public data, it's just dichotomized as white or other, um, but I think this could be accurately labeled as are, like, might you be racialized at the point of care in Canada? Um, and I'll show you some uh, unadjusted data. And then um, we also ran models adjusting for self-rated health, um, self-rated mental health in presence of chronic conditions. What I wanna emphasize here is that CCHS data um, have not consistently captured indigenous uh, status or identity, um, don't include people who live on reserve, but they're really innovative primary care reforms led by indigenous authorities and communities right now. But the survey data simply um, don't capture this well. And so different approaches are really needed to study these. And also those changes would be washed out with this provincial analysis. So a clear gap here um, is no attention to innovation and strength in primary care reform among Indigenous communities. So, sorry, this is relatively recent work, uh, just like a funded a month or two ago. Um, so apologize for the like small and not beautiful figures, but hopefully the arrows help show the trends. So the blue is that variable percent of people with a regular place of care. Orange is percent with a regular medical provider. So you can see it's a little bit lower people who have a regular individual person they go to versus a place they go to, which may be a walk-in clinic. It might be, I usually go to the ED emergency department. And then the bottom is consultations with a medical professional. On the left, this is broken down by household income. So middle and low, high versus low. And what you can see is there was a gap um, in terms of who had a regular place of care or a regular provider um, in 2007-8. And this has grown wider um, 10 years later. Looking at uh, who actually consulted with a medical professional, you see the arrows cross, which sort of bears out that data in British Columbia, where we saw similar rates of primary care service use uh, 20 years ago, and that that's um, a gradient has since emerged. Dwelling ownership is a slightly different measure. Here, what I want to emphasize is that we're not adjusting for age and people who are younger tend not to own their dwelling. So we would expect there to be a difference here. Um, but what I want to emphasize is, again, um, gaps have grown wider over time. But it's just a different way of looking at sort of wealth as opposed to income by the immigration group. Here we don't see that widening of gaps, but we see really substantial gaps that have persisted. Um, and when we look at this measure of racialization, again, we see gaps that have widened. Um, so to summarize all of this, um, I've got a little bit of a color-coded disaster, but let me walk you through it. Um, so this is the adjusted model. So when we actually like put in like everything that we might wanna, that might shape your need for healthcare, um, and looked at sort of three parameters in the model. So a change over time between the two years, overall, did things get better or worse? Um, the disparity that exists like in general, and then the change in disparity between the two years. Um, and red means it's getting worse, yellow means it wasn't different from one, and green means it's getting better. And in both the descriptive analysis that I showed you with the arrows and adjusted models, disparities in access to primary care services are either unchanged for the immigration group where they were already really wide or worse um, in the most recent year.
this data ends in 2017-18, uh, so before the pandemic. So now I want to turn to some of the analysis that we've been doing with the IRIS team around experiences of people who have immigrated to Canada. So this includes community engagement, admin data, and qualitative interviews. I'm just focusing on the analysis of administrative data. So this is linked population-based data um, in British Columbia. What I really want to emphasize is that this doesn't include everyone um, in that people with precarious or no status are not reflected uh, in these data. Um, it's only people who have um, eligibility for MSP for provincial health insurance. So one of the things we looked at was COVID-19 transmission over the course of the pandemic, comparing people who hold citizenship permanent residency or temporary status at time of enrollment for health insurance. And you can see um, that uh, this goes up until, or this doesn't include 2022 data, um, but uh, within those first two peaks, uh, a much the peaks were really pronounced um, among people with temporary status. So a higher um, people are more impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, but the primary care response is the inverse. Um, so uh, on the left is people and the percent of people who ever tested positive over the period uh, from January 2020 to April 21. And you'll see, so it's arranged by immigration status and then um, by neighborhood income, that same sort of five, uh, five quintile measure. And you'll see that within each category, there is a bit of a gradient. So among people who hold citizenship, people in the lowest income quintile, a slightly higher percentage of people tested positive, but these grow more pronounced among people uh, who have uh, immigrated um, and have permanent residency or temporary status, such that people who have temporary status who live in the highest income quintiles in British Columbia um, uh, had a higher percentage of people testing positive than this earlier period in the pandemic than people who hold citizenship. So this really emphasizes the role of status and how it shapes work environments and protections and rights afforded within Canada, and not just sort of neighborhood context and, um, and resources. On the other side, switching to the primary care story, the percent of people who had a visit with a primary, with a primary care physician where they talked about COVID concerns, they may or may not have been positive for COVID, but this was way lower among people with temporary status. Um, and like many more people who hold citizenship uh, talk to a family physician about uh, COVID-19 than actually test positive for it. So this really does show a door that is much more open to some than for others in support in the context of the pandemic. Then an additional piece of analysis around virtual and in-person primary care during the COVID-19 pandemic, this time comparing um, citizens and people who've been in um, uh, Canada for since before uh, 1984, long-term immigrants, so people who had immigrated but more than five years ago, and recent immigrants, people who immigrated within the past five years, and among that group, we divided people into those who had um, high or lower English language ability at time of arrival, and focused in on patterns among seniors, so people ages 60 plus. So among seniors, disparities in access to primary care widened over the pandemic. Oops, sorry, there's a typo there. So the figure shows the percent of people age 60 plus with any primary care visit within a six month period. This is a senior population. So on average, there are frequent visits to primary care, um, but you can see that that purple line, which reflects immigrants uh, who have been in Canada for less than five years and have low English language ability, there's always been a disparity. There was a dip in access for most groups in 2020, um, but the but it's wider now, um, or at least in the first part of 2021. Um, and again, in the adjusted models that sort of take into account all of the health conditions that people are treated for, um, your odds of any primary care visit in 2021 are dramatically lower as a senior um, with low English language ability who's been in Canada for a short time. And then we focused in on who actually saw a family physician in person, recognizing that early in the pandemic, um, visits dropped off because it was not possible to safely 
um, uh, provide care initially and people were, well, it was the period of adjustment uh, for primary care practices delivering care. Um, but then if we would imagine a population for whom uh, in-person services might be particularly helpful, seniors with low English language ability um, might face multiple barriers to successfully navigating virtual practice. So might be, um, um, it might be particularly helpful to get back for in-person visits. And we just haven't seen that happen. Um, they remain the lowest, uh, having the lowest odds of any in-person visits, uh, focusing in on the 2021 period. So those are my little data snapshots, but I wanna pull it together to really emphasize that access to primary care services has decreased over time and gaps in access have widened. Um, and I don't believe that primary care reforms have failed to address inequities, um, but rather that they have widened and entrenched them. It's not the responsibility of individual care providers working within complex systems, um, but it is a feature of the choices made at the level of policies and reforms. I also wanna emphasize that the pandemic didn't reveal this. These patterns predate the COVID-19 pandemic and gaps were already well known to patients and communities. Put differently, I we have inequity by design. So a disorganized system with weak primary care um, and only rarely primary health care, and where people need time and knowledge and often personal connections to navigate care entrenches inequity. Got the picture from St. Paul's because it was always like I was terrified to actually have to go to a meeting anywhere in St. Paul's. I didn't routinely work there and just like following the strips on the floor was impossible to me and I was there for meetings. Anyway, um, and that I want to make the case that barriers in getting through the front door of primary care compound throughout health systems. So looking ahead, um, we're at a place in time where I think primary care is receiving a lot of attention in Canada. People are struggling to find family doctors. Um, this is on the minds of policymakers in a way that it hasn't been consistently, um, understandably in the context of the pandemic perhaps. We're also at a point where groups that have pushed in different directions may be more aligned, um, provider organizations especially, what I mean by this is that oftentimes one of the main barriers to reform has been physicians associations who have sought to maintain the status quo, the systems they were used to practicing within. Um, and I think we're increasingly seeing recognition that systems that aren't healthy for patients aren't healthy for people delivering care within them. Um, and that there's a real appetite for change on the part of, especially people newly entering practice who really wanna be able to work differently and support communities in different ways. Um, I'd also observe that provinces are making new promises about equity in the policy documents that they're releasing. Um, so hard to find one that doesn't have EDI and blazons in multiple places. So a piece of work I'm involved in now um, is where uh, doing a new set of policy analysis, looking at documents over the period from 2018 to 2022. And in looking at these, um, I want to emphasize these mechanisms through which primary care policies have entrenched inequities so far um, and suggest some alternatives that we might hope to find instead. So I haven't done this work yet, but this is what we'll be doing um, over the next few months. Um, and so we know that the word equity is being used, but are the, is the content of the documents likely to support that? So up to this point, Performance measurement, which features really prominently in any policy document, um, in many ways have penalized care for parent, patients with more varied or complex needs. So one of the things I'm gonna look for um, is our, our performance measures like actively capturing features of equity-oriented care, including culturally safe and trauma-informed care um, and accountability for who's actually accessing services. Um, these are maybe in order of like, less to greatest importance. And this is a bit of a work in progress. So I'm excited for discussion afterwards. The two is, the second point is around resource allocation. So we've seen very clearly that up to this point, policies have concentrated primary care resources among people in communities who already had access. So looking forward, I'm really hoping to see that funding and resource allocations are better tailored to population need and flexible to respond to emergent or changing needs. And three, and likely most important, 
is there any measure of accountability to communities? Up to this point, this has been limited, unclear, or actively undermined. Any involvement for specific and identifiable communities in planning the services that will affect them. So looking ahead, I would hope to see if we are actually serious about the EDI emblazoned on the front of the policy documents, mechanisms where community governance is both required and supported, recognizing the work it takes um, to actually get that work done. We have examples to learn from. We're not starting from scratch. Community health centers have been accountable to specific known communities with attention to how they articulate needs and define quality and performance for decades. And they have done this even in very unsupportive policy contexts. Policy environments could instead support these models to really flourish. Um, and in doing so, place imagining a front door for primary care services in the hands of communities that use them. So this is my cop out. I'm actually not gonna tell you what a front door for primary care should look like, because I don't know. And it's gonna look different depending on who needs care. Um, but it is possible uh, for policy structures to work in service of this rather than against it. Um, and I'll keep you posted in terms of what we find in, uh, in looking through that. So that's all I had planned. I'd really welcome your questions, comments, or ideas for what a front door for primary care and healthcare more broadly should look like. Um, thank you so much for your time.